Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm a producer in the World Affairs Unit, and I first got interested in social media in about 2003, when social media wasn't really called social media. But um, I was looking. I was going to cover the Iraq War, and I was looking for a sort of quick and simple way of updating things for my family and friends and putting pictures up so everybody knew that I was safe. And so I started a blog, which was all the rage at the time. Um, and I found it was you know, a very quick and easy way to update, put text and pictures up. But it was never meant for anybody outside my immediate social circle. But of course, it was public. It was on the web. Um, and so people started following me, looking at it, and taking an interest in what I was doing because they were interested in the sort of behind the scenes uh, view of the, the Iraq war and the informal nature of, of what I was doing. Um, and even though I never intended it to be for a wider audience, it did pick up a wider audience and I got lumped together with a group of people uh, who during the Iraq war were called war bloggers. Um, it was a sort of a start of the, the blog thing, so we all sort of got lumped together because we were all doing similar things at a similar time. Um, while I was in Iraq, I was uh, injured I stepped on a landmine and my leg was amputated. And so I started writing about my recovery when I got home. And I picked up a, a different audience, a whole new bunch of people. And at that time, when I was quite limited in movement, I was in a wheelchair. And I found having a blog, having a direct channel of communication people, with people was really, I mean, it was great for me because I was sort of in a wheelchair. Uh, and being able to communicate with people around the world was, was great. And also, I found it was very different from the sort of communication I was used to having as a BBC journalist, where at the time it was very one way. So that's why I got involved in, in, in social media. Um, and now, of course, a lot has changed since 2003. Back then, I think for about three or four years, I did it largely under the radar. BBC bosses didn't know what blogs were. And even if they did, they, it wasn't something they thought that necessarily the corporation should have a view on. It was, so it was just something that, that I did. Now, of course, a lot has changed since then. Everybody knows now, uh, you know, there are social media policies. It's very much a, an integral part of what we do. So that's just the background to how I started. And I want to, for no more than 30 minutes, give you an overview of how I use social media now in my everyday job as a news gathering producer when I'm out and about covering stories or when I'm looking for stories, how I use social media. And then I'm interested to hear from you about the ways that you think you can adapt, you know, what I've told you and, and, and get some input from you. Um, I apologise in advance if you may have covered some of this ground already during the week. And if, if, uh, if you have, just tell me to skip over and I'll, I'll go forward. Um, I do want to stress at the outset, it's not my intention to tell you how to do social media. There's no, nobody can tell you how to do social media. Everybody will have their own uh, requirements, their own needs, depending on what you're doing, where in the broadcasting organization you're working and what you, what you want to achieve. So really, this is just me giving you an overview of this is what I do. Some of it may work for you, some of it may not, but it's, it's just, it's just my, my experience of using in social media. Um, so broadly, I use, I use social media in four, four different ways. I use it as a, a turbocharged wire service. I'm sure that's something you, you've been talking about this week to monitor breaking news in real time when I'm in uh, the newsroom, to find new sources and story ideas for things that I'm working on, to find people that I may not otherwise have been able to find, and finally to trail and promote the work that I'm doing and add value to the work that I'm doing. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by adding value in due course. So let's look at each of those points one by one. A turbocharged wire service. Um, those of you who work in the BBC will be used to seeing that interface. This is the normal EMPS interface that you see in the newsroom. But of course there you're limited to a fairly small number of sources. The usual sources, AP, AFP, Press Association, Reuters, a few others, the BBC's own copy service. But a fairly, fairly small number of sources. Now, up until fairly recently, that was my bread and butter. That was where I would go to get my news. That was all there was. Since I've started using uh, social media more, that will be open somewhere in my screen. But very often, I'm not looking at that. Um, I'm working off a laptop, and what I'm looking at is that, which is my uh, Hootsuite interface. 
some of you, have you I presume you talked about TweetDeck and, and things like that. I use Hootsuite. It's just a personal preference thing. Um, so that's what I'm looking at when I'm sitting at a desk in the newsroom. Because I'm not following four sources. I'm following hundreds of sources from governments to uh, government departments to news sources, both mainstream news sources and more offbeat news sources. I'm seeing what my BBC colleagues are saying about stories, getting a sense of what people are talking about. And the great thing about things like Hootsuite and having lists and being able to collate lists, either lists that I've put together myself or lists that other people have put together, is that depending on what stories I'm working on on a particular day, I can swap those lists around. So if I'm working on Syria, I can put a Syria list up there and keep a close eye on that. Then the next day I may be working on Yemen, so Syria's not so important. So I take that away and put Yemen in. So it's a constantly changing stream of news sources, not just, not just four sources, but hundreds of sources. Are your lists public? Mine aren't. They're not. They're not. Um, and and I've, I've chosen not to make them public for a reason. It's basically because I know that my colleagues in other news organisations are often working on the same stories that I am. And I kind of think if they want to put a list together, they can put the work in as well. Um, it's just purely to try and have a little... I mean, nothing stays exclusive for long. And certainly if I see a news story and I tweet it, then obviously other people are going to see that. But it's my way, and maybe it's a bit territorial, but it's my way of trying to have a little bit of exclusivity over the stories that I'm working on. Um, it's, just, it's just a matter of, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for putting stuff out there, but sometimes it's good to keep your cards a little bit, a little bit close to your chest. Monitoring breaking news. Um, for monitoring breaking news, I find Twitter now absolutely crucial, generally significantly quicker than the traditional wire service. Obviously, as I'm sure you've been talking about this week, you've got to keep your editorial wits around you. I noticed even in the past fortnight, both Robert Mugabe and Nelson Mandela have both been killed off on Twitter. Both of them are still with us. So, as, as, as I'm sure you all know, just because something's on Twitter doesn't mean it's true. With both of those stories, there were a lot of rumours, but actually there were no primary sources. Do you, do you treat Twitter as a single source? So, say, for example, you get the Wall Street Journal, AP, HuffPost, all saying Buffett has prostate cancer. Do you treat any tweets that come in like that as a single source and then any verification you get externally? Depends where they're coming from. Because sometimes the Wall Street Journal will be quoting AP. Yeah. Mm. Now that would be they one source. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. One, that would be one source. Okay, fine. And sometimes you get the AP, and then you'll get an AP reporter quoting the AP. Again, one source. Mm. So it's more of a patchwork situation where I'll go to each tweet and say, where is that coming from? Is that coming independently, or are they <laughs> quoting the same source? Are they getting it from the same press release? Uh, I still try and use that two-source rule, but sometimes it is obviously more difficult when everybody's referring back to, to other people. Um, as I say, a lot of rumours will be swirling around. Unsubstantiated rumours is part and part of social media, as I'm sure you all know. But I'm increasingly finding that Twitter and Facebook, rather than just reporting what other people are saying, is actually becoming a primary news source for me, and I'm using it as a primary source of, of breaking information. This is one example recently. This is a story that ran on AFP about uh, Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja, who's a human rights activist who's on hunger strike in uh, Bahrain. AFP wrote a story quoting his lawyer saying um, that he's feared dead. His lawyer said, We've had repeated attempts to contact him we can't and we're fearing the worst. That AFP story was picked up a lot and World, BBC World TV were among the news organisations that ran that as a news story saying Kawaja feared dead. I was across that story. I knew that uh, Al Kawaja's daughter Mariam had a Twitter account which I knew was verified. I knew it was her. So I started monitoring that Twitter feed and sure enough up popped a, up, up popped a, a tweet as long as no one family lawyer is allowed to see or speak to Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja, we cannot confirm or refute the news. A slightly different take on it. Not fear dead. Can't, can't say one way or the other. Maybe dead, may still be alive. A different slant on the story. Using Twitter as a primary source. 
So I was able to file copy into the system on the basis of that, saying, you know, contrary to reports that he's feared dead, his daughter says, we don't know one way or the other. And the news desk, when I filed that copy, said, thank you very much for that. We were going on that AFP story. We're going to row back and, and be a little bit more cautious. And sure enough, as, as far as we know, he is still alive a couple of weeks on. Another example of using social media as a primary source, using Facebook in this case. Uh, you may remember in February, Marie Colvin and Remy Ochlik, the two journalists who were working in Syria who were killed uh, while reporting in Homs. This is a, a group that I'm a member of, a group called the Vulture Club, which is a Facebook group for foreign correspondents and aid workers. A lot of the people who were involved in the operation to get Marie and Remy's bodies out of Syria were members of this group and were posting information first onto this group. I first heard that they were killed via this group and I was getting a lot of first-hand information from there. Hala Jabba is a reporter for the Sunday Times who was involved in the operation to get the bodies back. This is one of the posts that she put up saying the bodies were out of harms, that they'd been uh, identified and they were being repatriated. Primary information coming from social media long before the wires got it. And another thing that happened in this case, because the people on this particular Facebook group were so plugged into what was happening, they were saying to people in that group, there's a report on AFP that says this, there's a report on Reuters that says that. Don't go with it. We can't confirm it. It's not correct. It is correct. This bit is correct. This bit isn't. So all that conversation was going on in real time via Facebook. Now, in the past, I would have waited for it to drop on the wires. Now, I'm involved in a conversation and actually doing part of my news gathering via social media. Can I ask a question on this? Mm. With this group, this is a closed group? This is a closed group that I'm a member of. Because of your experience and who you are? Uh, partly. Um, I mean, I'll come to open groups in a while. I mean, this is, this is a sort of quite a specific example because, you know, it's a spe specific story. But... Everybody will have areas of interest that they may want to be members of groups. So in, in my case, I do a lot of stories about journalists and foreign news and, and hostile environment training and that sort of stuff. So I happen to be plugged into that group. Um, but it could equally apply if you're interested in health or education, yeah. being members of closed groups. Is it in exactly, whatever, whatever your subject is. Um, if I'm working on a breaking story... I don't know whether you... Have you looked at Twitterfall this week? I use Twitterfall quite a lot. I find that very useful. Um, and, of course, you can geolocate the tags there, which gives you another um, uh, a tool that you can use if you're looking for stories for a particular city or a particular country. Um, I used this recently in, in, uh, to give you one example. There was, a, there was a court case in the International Criminal Court. Thomas Lubanga, a Congolese warlord, was being sentenced... Uh, identify, I identified the day before a couple of people on Twitter who were working for civil society groups who said that they would be live tweeting from the court. So I was able to follow their hashtags on Twitter for and get the verdict in real time. And it dropped on the wires about, I think it was about five or ten minutes later. So I had about a five or ten minute jump on, uh, on the wires. And how did you treat that? I knew who the sources were. I was able to check out the sources beforehand. They were... Um, I was able to check out their Twitter feeds, check out... They'd been following the cases. Basically, the people that I was following had been following the case from the start, and they had a, a website with all the background information to the case. They worked as part of an NGO that was part of the Soros Foundation. So it was... I was so you, ma you made the decision yourself, yourself that, that these were valid... I was... I... I what I did is, because I knew the trial was coming, the day before, because I knew I was going to be covering that story, I sought out people on Twitter that I thought were trustworthy. Mm. Um, obviously, if, if you've got a breaking story and stuff is falling all over the place, it's much more difficult to make those kind of decisions. Mm. But I had a bit of time beforehand, because I knew I'd be covering that story, to identify people that might be useful on the day mm. to follow. So I, I suppose that they're all saying the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in this case, there were, I think, three people in the courtroom mm. who all dropped the verdict within a few seconds of each other on Twitter. And if there had only been two or one? Uh, if there had been... It depends on the source. I mean, it really just, if it was a BBC person... Yeah, BBC, that's fine. It's, you know, it's just interesting that mm. you know, we have our official sources. Sure. 
And then we have these, which are kind of semi-official, like the Soros Foundation. They are, deep, you know, they are. They may not be news agencies, but I would regard them as reliable, yeah, that's a key reliable point. sources. And and you, you know, you've got to use your own editorial judgment as to what you would regard as a reliable source. Um, okay. Finding sources and story ideas. Um, there's a number of story areas that I regularly write stories on and I'm, and I'm interested in. And I found that social media can be a really effective way of, of connecting with communities who share similar int interests to you, um, especially when you're looking for case studies. You know, often when you're doing a story, finding a good case study is sometimes you know, the hardest thing. And, and if you engage with communities who have, who have specific interests, then you can find, often find very motivated, very engaged and articulate people that you can then use for your, the stories that you're working on. Um, to give you one example of that, because I lost my leg in, in Iraq and I'm interested in, in artificial legs and sport. And believe it or not, there's a Facebook group for people who are amputees who are interested in sport, which I'm a member of and I contribute to, not always when I'm looking for stories, but just if I see things that I'm interested in. Um, a new product was released, uh, uh, an artificial leg that was sponsored by Nike, and I thought, oh, that's quite interesting with the Paralympics coming up, the fact that Nike's getting on board. I wouldn't mind writing something on that. So I put out an appeal on that group. As you can see there, I'm a journalist in London. I've been commissioned to write a piece for News Online about you know, Paralympic sport becoming sexy, the fact that Nike are getting involved. Tell me your opinions. And sure enough, people came forward who were, you know, they weren't marginal people. They were people who were genuinely interested in it. I could, I could double check who they were. I could background them just via social media. And sure enough, people started coming forward from all over the world. And this was for the international BBC website. So they were interested in getting an international aspect, not just people from Britain. And this woman came forward from um, Whitefish, Montana, uh, in the wilds in the States, Kimberly. She has her own website in which she talks about the action sports that she does. She was very, had some very strong views, very outspoken views that were, that were good and I thought were valid. She contacted me after that post. I followed that up with a message back to her. We had a conversation on Skype and her quotes made it into the final article. From start to finish, the whole process done through social media. And then, to sort of complete the circle, once I'd written up that story, I was able to link back to that, to the group that I'd started with, and say, thanks for all your input, here's the story, let's carry on the discussion. That's something I never would have done beforehand. Now, it just so happens this is an area that I'm interested in, that's why I wrote about it the first time. But it was very satisfying to see at the end of the process, 50 or 60 comments at the end of my link people saying this, that's a great article or I think this, I think that, and people getting involved in the debate. So, you know, it, it's a two-way process. I'm sort of asking for information, then once I've gathered that information, I'm, I'm putting it back out there. Um, similarly, sort of finding sources and story ideas, I increasingly find that Twitter and Facebook are great for spotting stories that haven't been picked up by other British news outlets. Because I'm exposing myself to such a wide range of news sources. You pick up stories before they've appeared in the British press. You know, those of us who work as producers on programmes, often the way we'd get story ideas is we'd pick up the morning papers and flick through and say, that's quite good, we'll do a two-way on that. That's quite good. Well, you've been there, Imogen. <laughs> now, by the t I would say nine times out of ten, by the time a story appears in the British press that's interesting, I've usually spotted it about two days beforehand because there's that lag time between the story being spotted, the British press picking up on it, somebody being commissioned to write about it and it appearing in the papers. Well, why not get ahead of the curve and spot those stories before they appear in the British papers? This is one example of, of a time that I did that. Uh, this is from NPR, the American radio station. Quite a nice radio story, I thought. It's, uh, it's Malcolm X gave a speech at American University in the 1950s, I think it was. The speech was lost and an American student found it and had the audio recording. I thought, that's a great radio story. Spotted it on NPR, checked, no British press had done it. I offered a piece to Radio 4 and it ran on the bulletins. 
I find these types of stories tend to be featurey stories. They tend to be sort of off-diary stories. You, you, you don't find so many hard news stories, because if they're real strong hard news stories, often you'll hear about them anyway. But for sort of off-diary stories, quirky stuff, nice-to-haves, exposing yourself to all of those, those sources you know, is, is, is a really good way of, of spotting stories. And if you've, you know, if you've got a program, if you think, oh, we could just do some, something lighter, often you find those kind of stories um, through social media. Yeah. Can I just ask you, when you were talking about um, you know, the groups, communities that you find on Facebook, yeah. when you're searching for them, I mean, it, you know, you're looking amputees in sport, in that search bar up the top, are you literally writing amputees sport? Or, uh, yeah. I yeah. don't know, Australia has hack or... Yeah I, mean, yeah, 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 I mean, you can be as broad as that. And I tend to go look for groups, because obviously you'll get... You know, depending on the search terms, you go like Chelsea Football Club, you'll get hundreds of groups. But I tend to go for groups that are active and have got a good number of members. There's no point joining a group with two members, you know, you're not going to get a lot of discussion there. But if it's a group with sort of a couple of hundred, you know, a few hundred members or more, it looks like people are posting up regularly. And I think that's quite a useful group to be part of. I mean, and it can be, I mean, it is literally, I am, you know, when I'm, sometimes people tell me about the groups or... If I'm in a member of one group, people say, I'm also a member of this group. You may want to join up both. So you join the dots that way. But if I'm starting from scratch, it can be as simple as Australia journalists, Melbourne journalists, whatever, you know, whatever your search terms are, and just see what comes up. Would you recommend, though, being... Uh, I mean, how many groups are you part of just on a day-to-day -day basis? And how many do you join based on a story that... I would say I'm sort of active in, I try and, I mean, you can get overwhelmed by, you know, if you join too many groups, your Facebook timeline is just deluged with stuff. So I'm sort of active probably in about half a dozen groups covering a sort of relatively small range of stories because I think you try and do too much and you just get swamped by it. But I, I think it's good if you, especially if you've got a specific beat, you know, if you're doing London education or you know, Sheffield crime or whatever. You know, if, you've got, if you can narrow it down and find a few groups that are particularly useful, then, then it, can be a, it can be a really um, useful tool for, for spotting stories and then for putting those stories back out once you've done them. Um, and then we move on to sort of trailing, promoting, adding value to your work. Um, especially for those of us who work at the BBC, the, sort of, the idea of advertising your work isn't something that comes very easily to us. It sort of feels a bit vulgar. But my, uh, my argument is if you're doing work that you're proud of and you want people to watch or to, to read, then surely you want it to go to as wide a possible audience as possible. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. And, and social media gives you a very easy way of, of doing that. And I, I, I sort of promote and trail my work in a number of, of ways. Things like this, posting pictures on Twitter. I was at Downing Street this week with James Robbins, a diplomatic correspondent, so just put a little picture up on Twitter, say I'm working on China for BBC News, I may put up a picture saying I'm in Jerusalem, you can hear the story on the world tonight, this evening or on Friday, you know, just to give a sense of um, news gathering as a work in progress. I think the thing I like about these kind of techniques is, you know, people are used in the past to getting the news as this final, pro final package. They sit in front of the 10 o'clock news and here's the news. But actually, you know, some of these techniques allow you to give a sense of the behind-the-scenes sense of a work in progress, of going to interview people, of, of gathering the information, which, you know, some people quite like the idea of having a, an insight into that world. Um, when I'm editing a TV or radio piece, often I take a short clip and post it up on Audioboo or YouTube and say, here's a clip from an interview I've done. You can hear more of this interview or see more of this interview on BBC News on tomorrow or whatever. Um, and just s sort of give little teases or trails that people who are following me who might be interested in that particular story will make a date to listen to something that, or to see something that otherwise they wouldn't. And actually, you know, I've had quite a number of occasions where people have tweeted me back and said, oh, I made a point of listening to The World Tonight or the Today programme this morning because I knew you were going to have a piece on there. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of sort of free advertising, if you like. Another thing that I do increasingly is 
to take extracts that other, you know, before now would end up on the cutting room floor mm. and put those out on Twitter and uh, on uh, Audio Boo and YouTube because, you know, as we all know, you may do a 20 minute interview and only 20 seconds of that interview gets used and the rest just sits there and never gets out. Um, and, you know, if it's a good interview, then why not give an extended extract? So that's what I did in, you know, this case. I was in, I was in Israel, I was in Jerusalem. <laughs> had a lovely interview with a, a translator who was talking about the relationship between Israel and the Iranians. She was very eloquent, great talker. But in the, in the space of a package, I used about 20 seconds of her. And I thought, that's oh, such a waste. It's such a great interview. So I tend to try and keep the clips quite short because I think people's attention span is quite short. You don't want to put necessarily put 15 minutes up there because people just won't stick with it. But a nice little clip, 50 seconds, that didn't get aired of this interview talking about Israel and the Iranians with a, you know, a locator to where the interview was done. Just adding value, making the most of the material that you've got. And I find that because everything... All my news gathering I tend to do on my laptop now. I'm using Adobe Audition. I'm using Final Cut Pro. I'm connected to the internet. Actually, it doesn't take an awful lot of extra work to rip off another clip, top and tail it, post it up on Audio Boo. I mean, you know, you can do something like that in a couple of minutes. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of work, and it just gives another dimension to the stories that you're working on. So, you know, just to conclude, those, those are just... You know, a few of the techniques that I use, and then I'm, in, you know, interested to get your input as well, so maybe we can, you know, open this up to, for discussion. In a fairly short space of time, um, social media has become an absolutely central part to what I do. It's not official. It, I, you know, I don't do it as part of my... No, there's nothing in my contract that says you will do social media. It's just something that I do because I get a lot out of it and I find it's useful uh, to be engaged in because I, I get as much back in terms of stories and enjoyment as I, as I put in. But, you know, as I'm sure something that has been mentioned before this week, it's, it's informal, it's not official. But for me personally, I think the, the idea of having a personal profile and a public profile has kind of gone away. I know, I don't know whether you've talked about Rory Kecklin Jones this week. He's got his personal Facebook, uh, personal Twitter and his professional Twitter. I've chose not to go down that route because I don't, th I think if you put yourself out there, and you say, I work for the BBC, then there is no, no differentiation between the personal and the private. The, the differentiation is what you choose to put up there. But I think you do everything with your BBC hat on. So I always apply the Daily Mail test to anything that I put out on Twitter or Facebook. You know, would I want it to appear on the front page of the Daily Mail with my name and BBC journalist next to it? If the answer is yes, I would, wouldn't mind it appearing on the Daily Mail, it's probably OK. If I wouldn't, I tend to row back. So just... Don't be lulled into too much of a sense of informality and keep your BBC or your whatever broadcast you're working for, keep your professional hat on uh, at all times.